plant growth and development and how it impacts production of floriculture crops. And we need to introduce a little bit about some basic biology and basic differentiation, growth of differentiation, and how it impacts the production of flowers. And starting at the, the most basic definition, and that is what does it take for an organism to actually be alive? And there's lots of definitions of life. And the, the, the best definition is that for an organism to be alive, it must be irritable. But what irritable means, you respond to a stimulus, okay? Um, so the next thing for an organism to be de defined as being alive, it must reproduce. Increase in cell number, increase in cell size, uh, increase in number of uh, progeny. Reproduce, it needs to grow. And finally, it needs to metabolize. In other words, it needs to have chemical processes and biological processes where it's, it, it actually metabolizes itself. And in basic botany, we think of two stages of development as a plant grows. There's differentiation, uh, where different cells differentiate into different tissues. You covered a little bit of this in plant propagation, where you talked about de-differentiation into root and meristems, stuff like that. Um, and we form new organs based upon differentiation of tissue, whether it be a root, a leaf, fruit, flower, so forth. And any situation where a meristematic region of cells, a meristematic region of cells, gives rise to two or more different kinds of tissues or different kinds of cells, that's classified as differentiation. And these are qualitative differences, means there's a change in form and structure. The other part of development is growth. Growth is different than differentiation in that it's a quantitative change. In other words, we're changing in cell numbers and cell size. Differentiation is potentially reversible. Growth is not. Okay? So typically growth and differentiation, we hope it ha all happens at the same time. That plants are growing and generating different kinds of organs all at the same time. Um, and you can have growth without differentiation. And that, for instance, a callus mass, if you're rooting cuttings or if you're doing tissue culture and you just get this glob of cells, that's growth without differentiation. It's not until they start to form leaf primordia, root primordia, or something to like that, the differentiation is starting to occur. So the cell lines in plants that typically grow without differentiation are called parenchyma cells and parenchyma cells are in a lot of different places of the plant. So this is a little picture of an African violet um, cutting. Okay. In bio <laughs> <laughs> Those that are listening to this recording and not in lecture are going to be confused what the red lines are. And the red lines are, as I was looking at something the other day and I was practicing with a pen scribe on the lecture and these are my doodles that mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> in biology, organisms take up simple substances from the environment to grow and differentiate. Plant takes up water, carbon dioxide, nutrients. Mammals take up um, beer, um, pizza, um, fried chicken. And these simple substances are take, or, are modified into complex uh, substances to make up the cells, and ultimately the increase in living tissue is growth. So, if you are a single-celled organism, growth is only increases in cell size and cell division. Multicellular organisms, much more complex, they have division, they have cell enlargement, not all cells contribute to plant to growth, okay? And growth is in plant tissue is restricted to 
what we call an embryonic region. And the embryonic regions are what we call meristems. And plants, all growth is restricted to meristems because mature cell structures, mat mature tissue, is locked in place by cell walls, okay? Doesn't change unless something happens to those cell walls. And these, uh, for instance, the xylem actually is classified as non-living cell tissue, okay? Don't use the word dead because it's not dead, it's non-living. What's the difference? Well, I think of dead as being rotten and not doing anything, but these are still translocating water. Most living cells have the ability to retain, to divide under certain conditions. Question. Why is xylem dead if it's irritable? Xylem is not irritable. No. Xylem is not irritable. It's non-living in that what happens, the xylem tissue forms, okay? The xylem tissue forms and the membrane and these vacuoles and the cytoplasm go away and it serves basically as a pipe, okay? Good question. So the apical meristem is the primary meristem that we think about for most parts. And for once, my little red arrow points to the right thing. <laughs> apical meristems are found in the tip regions where plant growth occurs. Tips of stems, tips of roots, uh, typically on the proximal side, which means the opposite end of the growth spectrum. And apical meristems are what we call permanently embryonic. Permanently embryonic. And for instance, this is a cross-section of a coleus stem, and the apical meristem is this complex in the middle, right with the red arrows pointing. We have lateral meristems down below. Determinate meristems have an embryonic phase they grow and expand, and once the entire organ maintain, gets its, to its mature size, the embryonic phase ends and the meristematic development ceases. That means it's determinate, like a determinate tomato versus an indeterminate tomato. A determinate tomato grows, flowers, sets fruit, and is done. Indeterminate grows forever. In uh, determinate meristem tissue are, are organs like leaves, like fruit, like flowers, and so forth. So in this picture, we have a, a leaf blade. The leaf blade itself is what we call indeterminate, where the axillary bud has a meristem, which is permanently embryonic. Lateral meristems increase in the stem thickness. That's what we think of as cambial tissue. The cambium is a lateral tissue, lateral meristem, or the cork phylogen, which is just inside the bark. It's constantly growing. Lateral meristem, like the cambium, is permanently embryonic. That's why we can do grafting. That's why we can root cuttings. That's what those things, how those work. Intercalary meristem, this is a meristematic region that occurs in monocots, grasses, um, and it's the meristematic region between two mature tissues. And for instance, here we have uh, a bamboo or a dracaena drawing where the intercalary meristem is right here at each node, and that's what expands. Now you've all witnessed this if you've ever seen a field of sweet corn blow over. What does the sweet corn do when it blows over? Exactly, it grows up. And it's because the intercalary meristem reverts itself, becomes embryonic, and grows in a fashion to make the plant grow upright again. When you mow grass, the blade of grass doesn't grow, the intercalary meristem grows and puts more grass out there. 
So the intercalary meristem is where we see plant development there. So when we think of a plant as a whole system, there's basically just roots and shoots. Those are the only two plant parts we really worry about, roots and shoots. And typically, the roots are below ground, the hidden half, and shoots are above ground. And we've tap roots, branch roots, axillary buds, inner nodes, terminal buds, nodes, on and on and on. The shoot has several levels of differentiation. We have stems, leaves, buds, and flowers. Those are all modifications of the shoot or the stem. So organs, we have differentiation with, the, they differ in cell type, they differ in tissue type. The levels of differentiation change over time from a seed, as a seed germinates, into a root shoot embryo, organ primordia, apical meristem, um, other life cycle phases, switches from vegetative phase to reproductive phase, some of these are progressive over time. For instance, we have juvenile phase trees and adult phase trees. In trees and woody tissue, roots are always juvenile. Shoots will not, when that's a hit the adult phase, they become fruiting structures. And it could be changed by environmental conditions, and then there's also morphological changes. For instance, English ivy is a ground cover in its juvenile stage, in its adult stage, English ivy is actually a shrub. And I don't know if Dr. Klett has talked to you about that or not. And in plant propagation, juvenile phase tissue is much easier to root than adult phase tissue. Okay, so in the shoot apical meristem, in, uh, there's two distinguishable zones in flowering plants. And we have what's called a tunica and a corpus. And tunic or tunica is like wrapped around something, like a toga. What's a tunic, tunicate bulb? Have you ever heard of a tunicate bulb? Like an amaryllis? Amaryllis or just an onion. Whereas a scaly bulb is like a, a lily. But a tunicate, tunica means it's the outer mantle, the surrounding area. In the corpus, corpus is Latin for body, and it refers to the internal area. And the histogen layers, depending on the species, is different layers of, um, of tissue in here. And for instance, those that are doing tissue culture of plants like African violets, they can actually go in and select different room, regions doing tip tissue culture of the histogen layers and get deviations in flowering patterns. That's where some of those flowering patterns come from, is that they've s harvested different parts of tissue and then grown it out. African violets are very easy to grow from tissue culture. Uh, called a chimera. Not exactly. Chimera is when you have two different tissues growing together where you actually merge those two tissues together. Good example is the Sansevieria, the snake plant, where you have light green variegation and dark green variegation. That's a chimera where they've actually joined two different cultivars of Sansevieria together into one leaf. That's a chimera. So the tunica, cell wall differentiation is anticlinal. You know, it's, it, it's along the axis of the mitotic spindle, it's a uh, parallel surface, and it grows this way. And it's typically one cell layer thick. Some have different histogen layers, of course, like we were just talking about. And this is where this type of differentiation occurs of the tunica. The corpus is anticlinal, periclinal, and this is this dense zone of cell growth that's constantly growing. And this is the tissue that we call permanently embryonic. Other areas of apices, um, they go all over the place. Typically, we have um, 
groups of central mother cells where there's a low rate of division, and that's this area in here where it kind of slows down. This is a boundary area. You can see these little bumps, those, those will form into meristems eventually. But primarily, what I wanted you to see is down here in the, in the bottom of this picture, we have what's called the procambium. The procambium is the protofloam and the protoxylum. These are the early stages in development of our vascular tissue. It's for this reason that carnation growers and uh, African violet growers and other growers can come in and do a maris harvest the meristematic region of the cells, grow new plants, and since it's not physically connected in any way to the vascular tissue, uh, vascular wilts, uh, verticillium diseases such as that cannot be translocated to this area. One of the things that growers do with, um, the breeders do with poinsettias, is a lot of their cultivars, they'll develop them for many, many years based upon the meristematic region when they're ready to release the cultivar. They will take this bud union and graft it onto a mature plant because there's a actually a um, virus that's endemic and indigenous to poinsettias that causes them to be branching, lower, shorter, and that's how they get the shorter, more branching patterns in poinsettias. It's actually induced by a virus. So, leaves, leaves come from the flank, and these divisions come in little protuberances, and eventually these arise um, as buds, axillary buds, and as long as this is actively developing up here, it's generating a lot of auxin, endolacetic acid, and the endolacetic acid is translocated through the tissue, which holds the lateral buds in check. So that when you go in and shear that meristem off, like in chrysanthemums, we'll go into a pinching, it releases these lateral buds to do, uh, get more bushy growth, more, more shearing and hedging. Okay, so that's in part what this part of the plant controls a lot of. So the overall development of a leaf, we first have the foliar buttress, then we have the formation of the leaf axis, formation of the lamina or the, le the blade part. They divide um, to form the protuberance and eventually uh, develops a full leaf and it's all developed dependent on a balance of auxin and cytokinin. Yeah. And we can, monitor, we can modify some of these things in the greenhouse as we grow our plants. Leaf shape and leaf patterns. Um, primarily, we get our different leaf shapes and leaf patterns based upon the uh, shape of the primordium, which is governed by the genetics number and distribution and orientation of cells, and how fast they grow, or the distribution of cell enlargement. Now, most of the leaf growth occurs right around the leaf veins, because that's where we have our um, vascular tissue and leaf. If the, the leaf grows at the same speed with the veins, we have what's called a simple leaf. And if they're vigorous near the veins and slow in between the veins, we have a lobed leaf. So, in other words, a lobed leaf is going to have vigor, uh, vigorous growth in, the, in this region and slow growth in this region. And a simple leaf goes like that, more uniform. Leaves will develop different sizes based upon uh, how much light they have. For instance, if you look at a leaf in the full sun versus a leaf in the shade, the full sun leaf is going to be smaller, denser, more compact, have more cell layers of palisade parenchyma than the sun leaf, and it's going to be wider, thinner, so it can open itself up for, for more leaf capture. This is part of the acclimation process that we do bet going between sun and shade leaves for bringing in plants into the interior scape. Let's jump to roots. 
Roots are basically the same as sh shoots, except that we don't have any lateral organs in originating at the apex, OK? And growth is uniform. And the apex, apex is formed by a root, covered by a roof cap, root cap. So the branching occurs much further back. It doesn't occur from a lateral meristem or anything like that. Uh, we have a root, root cap, which is a dense compaction of cells that serves to more or less uh, protect the root as it's growing into the soil, pushing through the soil. This is the way it pushes through the soil. Um, apical meristem, this is the region where we have the most active cell development, cell wall. Uh, cell division and cell expansion is in the apical meristem region. And the region of elongation is starting to spread out. Region of maturation, this is where we're starting to see root hairs. Now root hairs actually are a, an appendage or a um, trichome development off of the epidermal cell. Okay, So it's part of the epidermal cell, the root hair. And th this is further back beyond, behind the region of elongation where you start to see the root hair. So if you've got active root development, this is all happening in about a millimeter. And then behind this zone, you can see that we're starting to see the protoxylum and the pro uh, protofloam. Um, we have the meristematic tissue, which we call um, the parenchyma area and protoderm. And the vascular steel ins that's inside the cortex is actually protected by what's called the Casparian strip or the cambial layer of tissue. Okay, So kind of covering all of these things leading up to flowering. Flowers are actually, in fact, nothing more than a modified stem. A flower has leaves, it has buds, it has meristems. Now the flower primordium is originally a vegetative meristem. And it relies on a signal, a biological signal, to change its differentiation patterns to become a reproductive meristem. Now, that change could be environmental, temperature, photo period, something like that. Or it could be maturation. Like an annual plants, they get to a certain point, they get to a certain age, they're going to bloom. So the transition from flowering, for instance, this is a, a, a drawing of what we call a biennial plant, where we have a vegetative meristem. It's got leaf primordia to be changed into an inflorescence, it's easy to change to with a day length change or a temperature change. And now that vegetative primordia is turned into a reproductive primordia, and we form flowers. So here is the cross section of a flower. Um, I think this is a coleus flower, but I not remembering. Can't remember what this is. Anyway, we have a floral meristem. And one of the things, a floral meristems are t t from different from a reproductive meristem, and they tend to be a little bit flatter. And what happens is the first level of differentiation in a floral meristem is we have the formation of the sepals. On the outside, everything is from the outside in. Then we see the formation of the petals. As time progresses, the next level of differentiation of the stamens. See, guys, we did come first. <laughs> and then finally, we get the carpal development. So it goes from the outside in. So we have the sepals the petals, the stamen, and development of the pistil, which ultimately forms the carpillary region. 
looking at this in a bigger picture, andresium is what we call the male parts, stamen, filament, anthers, the gynesium, pistil, stigma, style, ovary, ovules, of course, petals, sepals, and pedicel. If a plant has all of these parts, all of these flower parts, what kind of flower is that? Perfect. It's a perfect flower. Okay? <laughs> no. Complete. It's a complete flower. Uh, perfect flower is perfect flower, flower, all what does it have to have to be a perfect flower? To be a perfect flower in a perfect world, what do you have to have? A male part and a female part. That's it. <coughs> complete is the complete package. Perfect is just male and female parts. <laughs> so this is what we're looking for. We'll talk about how many flowers you see in this picture. Thousands upon thousands because each petal is actually a flower in the chrysanthemum. So flower development. My computer is sending me lots of messages. Where is the flower in this picture? The poinsettia. Okay, we've got a, br that's right, this is a bract. The red part? Actually, the flowers are this little cluster in the middle called cyathea. These are the flowers. Okay? So, actually, in a poinsettia, the, the big, gaudy red bracts, those are actually modified leaves. The flower in euphorbia is just here, in the middle. So what regulates plant growth? What changes all these meristems? What changes all these different things? We just th threw a semester of plant growth and development. So these are the things that modify plant growth. We have temperature, photoperiod, water, nutrition, mechanical changes, mechanical regulation of plant growth, as well as plant growth regulators that we can apply. Temperature, we already talked about temperature earlier. Temperature is controlled by the convective air currents, conduction. There is chemical plant metabolism that changes temperature. Photosynthesis changes temperature. We typically don't think of that too much in plants because the environment controls plant temperature more than anything else. Radiant control is as it radiates energy away from itself, reflection, but primarily evapotranspiration. So when we have plant temperature or plant growth in relationship to temperature, we start off what's called the baseline temperature. Okay? And this particular drawing, the baseline temperature is right at about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, right, right, right about here. The baseline temperature is that point where no plant growth occurs. No plant growth occurs, but the plant doesn't die. This is what the modelers use when they to develop their, their production models for calculating how many degree days it takes for you to get a crop off the bench. Now, above the base temperature, growth increases proportionally as temperature increases. And this is actually a logarithmic growth curve. We call this the log phase. I'm sure you've heard that before in microbiology or some other places. But this is the log phase. This is the linear range where plant growth occurs. Growth rate continues until the optimum growth, the rate of growth continues until the optimum temperature is reached. And this is what we call the optimum temperature where growth is maximized. And this is the point where you need to figure out, as a, a grower, how fast you want your plants to grow and how much can you afford to heat your greenhouse. Once you get past this point, though, get past the optimum temperature, the plants start to decline because it's just too hot. So 
So the optimal crop temperature for plant production in the greenhouse, it really depends on what your definition of growth is. And definition of growth is really dependent upon the crop. What are you trying to grow? Definition of plant growth for a tomato grower is different than the definition of plant growth for a rose grower. Okay? They have different objectives. Is it an increase in mass? Do you want a bigger plant? Do you want it to come on faster with earliness? Do you need plant height? Do you need more flowers? What are you going for? This is species dependent. It changes with the stage of crop development. You might want to use different temperatures. Chrysanthemum growers between the vegetative stage and the reproductive stage when they're going from plant growth to plant bloom, they change the temperature, stage of crop development, and the temperature is also going to be based upon is it day or night. Species from warmer climates typically have higher optimal temperatures because that's the temperatures that they evolved around. Um, plants like Dianthus, Fuchsia, Primula, they're colder. Um, some plants like English daisies, if you get them too warm, they actually die. Whereas you get into the more tropical plants, uh, African species, Xenia, Vinca, New Guinea, they thrive in warmer temperatures. What does this mean to you? Well, that means that you're probably not going to grow fuchsia and zinnia in the same greenhouse. Or you might say one will be at the fan side, one will be at the pad side. Stage of development. The optimal temperature for chrysanthemums is um, we drop the temperature as the plant matures. As the plant matures, as we drop the temperature, what it does is it intensifies our um, color of our, of our blooms. Dropping the temperature with poinsettias intensifies the coloring of the bract. So these things change in crop de development. Uh, high day temperatures encourages photosynthesis. Lower night temperatures reduces respiration. We want to save the sugars that we make because we may need them for something else. And when we have these together, we get bigger plants. The optimal crop temperature is going to change our leaf unfolding rate. And this will be specifically related to Easter lilies. When we talk about Easter lilies, we, we use the leaf unfolding rate to calculate when that crop is going to be harvested. High leaf unfolding rate means that it's, it's growing fast. And leaf unfolding rate is actually proportional to the average daily temperature. So Easter lilies, the leaf unfolding rate is proportional and works on this curve. We can control plant height, negative diff, positive diff. Response to diff is greater under short days. So it actually is um, co-dependent on one another with, with photosynthesis, with a photo period. And of course, it's most um, sensitive during the first two to three hours of daylight because that's when our highest rate of photosynthesis occurs. Um, here are some pictures of diff. Um, these are Easter lilies. Uh, Nellie White is the primary Easter lily that's grown in the United States. Ace is more European. And you can see where how well we're controlling plant height with um, temperature, with pulse treatments of diff right at uh, that first two hours of sunlight. Now, every plant has got an optimal temperature for plant for flower initiation. Flower initiation is typically reduced with high temperature stress. Chrysanthemums, for instance, we can they'll slow by at least a week if you get above 85 degrees. We call that heat delay. Night temperatures less than 63 for New Guinea impatiens, you know, the key word is New Guinea, um, actually decreases flowering. And night temperatures greater than 74 will de delay poinsettia bloom by about a week. How long would that pulse be in the chrysanthemums for the stuff to Say that again, please. The chrysanthemums, that 85 degree temperature? It's typically a week. 
Why, uh, how long would that they be exposed to that 85 degree temperature to cause that leak? Uh, to cause a heat delay, uh, 85 degree temperature stress, probably three, four days in a row for two, three hours at a time is enough to cause a heat delay. For instance, the southern growers in the southern part of the United States that grow uh, chrysanthemums automatically program the heat delay into their crop in the summer months. There are some species, there are some cultivars that are more tolerant of heat delay and they'll choose the cultivars. So, for instance, this is a uh, geranium, a regal geranium, which is, uh, regal geranium is a, a geranium that's coming back into popularity because uh, it's more, a little more difficult to grow. Regal, or some people call them Martha Washington geraniums, and you go to the go to the better um, garden centers, and these are the geraniums that have leaves that feel like cardboard. Okay, They're real stiff. Okay, and they have to have a um, temperature pa uh, pattern where we have our night temperature on the left hand side and our day temperature on the right and if we get above a night temperature of 80 you can see that we don't have any flowering and it re relies on a different relationship of blooms to control that flowering and we can use these temperature night day differences to actually schedule our flowering because the Martha Washington geranium is very popular for Mother's Day. We can control plant growth with light, I mean brighter light, s shorter plants. We can also control our plant growth with photoperiodism. Short day plants, the ones that have long dark periods in order to bloom like chrysanthemums and poinsettias, these are what we call obligate photoperiodic plants, obligate photoperiodic plants. In other words, the plant is obligated to bloom under those conditions and it will not con bloom at all without those conditions. Facultative means eventually they're going to bloom anyway whether you have the right environment or not, but it won't be as good of a bloom. And a lot of our plants are faculty will bloom better under short days or better under long days, but they're facultative. For instance, snapdragons are facultative long day plants, increasing the photo increasing the light duration on snapdragons, we can cut about six to seven days off of our production cycle just by adding light. Photo period is um, has a seasonal periodic periodicity. It's changing constantly, and this is a chart where we have January through the uh, end of December on the bottom axis, and the um, y-axis is actually our photo period in hours, or the numbers of uh, day period versus dark period. And the different lines represent different latitudes away from the equator. In other words, the one that says 10 degrees here that's right in the middle, you can see that the photo period only changed, that's 10 degrees latitude, only changes about an hour throughout the entire year. So for instance, the critical photo period on a chrysanthemum is 12 hours and 15 minutes. So um, there's certain times of the year where it's going to be just automatically going to bloom and all we need to do to control that to keep it from blooming is to provide some light. Where we're at 40 degrees latitude here in uh, this part of Colorado actually just a little above 40 degrees latitude and you can see how much of our uh, throughout our uh, photo period changes from 16 and a half hours all the way down to uh, right at 10 and a half hours. So I, not as drastic. I grew up in Montana, which is 45, a little higher. Go up to 50, and you can see what the poor folks in Alaska and Sweden and places like that have to deal with. Where is 40 degrees north latitude in Colorado? Anybody know? Baseline. Baseline highway. 40 degrees latitude is, is it's what we call baseline. So baseline highway, highway 7. Don't go away mad. <laughs> so
So how do we extend the photo period? Chrysanthemums, again, are short-day plants. And here's a field crop of, uh, of chrysanthemums. Um, and you can see the, um, the lights being strung. This is in Southern California. Um, and they will use the, keep the lights on, give it a night interruption to uh, keep that, those uh, chrysanthemum plants vegetative for the longest period of time. They'll do this in the winter months. Uh, this is uh, San Luis Rey uh, is where this farm is. And during the winter months, they can grow chrysanthemums pretty much year round. And they're using this chart that I showed you before to extend the photo period, primarily in this range here, to keep the plant from blooming so they can get the chrysanthemum up to a certain height, turn the lights off. The natural photo period is, the dark period is naturally long enough that it'll go ahead and bloom and uh, have a long stem chrysanthemum. Incandescence, uh, typically we shoot for 10 foot candles at the, at the uh, meristem region. Activity is at the meristem. Uh, some people will use um, day continuous or pre-dawn, uh, but we find that the night interruption lighting is the most efficient. However, a lot of growers will use what we call cyclic lighting because they don't have the power to run all their lights on at once. So light a bank, turn it off, light a bank, turn it off, light a bank, turn it off, and start over again because we don't have enough energy to run the whole system. To shorten the day period, we've got to actually cover the plant with an opaque material because we want to keep the, foot, the light intensity under two foot candles. Stray light will damage, will, will disrupt photo, photo period. Security lights, security guards flashlight will disrupt things. Um, you have to pay attention because if we're covering our plants in the heat, of, at the, at the, right as the sun's going down, the greenhouse is already hot, we're going to get, provide heat delay because we're going to get hot under that black cloth. So it's typically better to extend the photo period in the morning when it's cooler. And you want to make sure you don't do any skips. That's why black cloth, pulling black cloth in a greenhouse is better to be controlled by a time clock and a machine and not by counting on your employees to come in and not be hung over and forget to do uncover or forget to cover them or something like that because you'll get uh, malformed flowers. Water stress. Some growers use water stress to make the plants grow shorter or more compact, make them to use water stress to harden off their plants. Um, we can use excess water to increase stem elongation. And in some species, a little bit of water stress speeds flowering. When you damage plants, the plants' evolutionary response to damage is to bloom. For instance, we can stimulate adult phase tissue in citrus by scoring the bark. I think you may have talked about that in plant prop, perhaps. I know it's in Hartman, Kester, and Davies' textbook. Fred Davies and the Hartman, Kester, Davies, and there's another author now. Fred Davies was my major professor. So I, I know that book pretty well. Nutrient stress. Uh, reducing nitrogen, some growers will actually reduce phosphorus to keep them short. Ex some plants, some growers will use high fertility to give it a high EC level to stunt the plants. It takes a skilled grower to do that. And of course, nitrate nitrogen gives us a harder, more compact plant. Container size, restricting the container size can sometimes give us a more compact plant, but it's not a good way to control plant growth. Another form of controlling plant growth uh, is called thigmomorphogenesis. Thigmomorphogenesis. Thigmo refers, the Latin root of thigmo is to touch. Okay? So a thigmomorphogenic response is when a plant is being constantly touched. And this is Dr. Joyce Latimer at Virginia Tech. And she's developed a technique where the plants can be brushed all day long or several times a day, and it'll keep the plants more compact, okay? Uh, 
when you get a little older and have uh, kids looking for science fair project, a really good science fair project is to have the plant, have a tomato plant growing in the house. Every morning have the child come in and pet the plant and say, nice, pl nice plant, nice plant. You're a nice plant and pet the plant. Take the other one. I'm not going to touch you. <laughs> nice plant. I'm not going to touch you. The one that was touched every day will be shorter. The one that's never been touched Yelling at it has nothing to do with it. <coughs> we'll grow bigger. There's actually a genetic response to a compound called calmodulin that's responsible to this. We see it all the time. How tight do you stake a tree? What are they teaching in our culture? How tight do you stake a tree? Do you tie it tight? No. You want it to move a little bit. That move, that vibration, that's seismomorphogenesis, okay? The movement, okay? Makes it stronger, more getting bigger girth, okay? Constantly tearing tissue. Same thing happens with a weightlifter. They're tearing muscle tissue, it regrows stronger. So, what's happening here is by brushing the plants twice a day, you can have more compact plants. This is a, this is a valuable tool for the organic grower that doesn't want to use any plant growth regulators, especially for crops like tomatoes. Yes? Are we strictly speaking in terms of internode elongation or also biomass accumulation as well? We're speaking primarily in internode elongation, the biomass is not changing. They actually have the same biomass. They'll okay. be thicker and the leaves will be thicker and um, more pronounced, stuff like this, but the stems will be th that will be more shorter. And actually, if you look at your supplemental reading on um, WebCT, I have Dr. Latimer's paper there for you to read. So, there's lots of stuff, there's lots of stuff to read in there. Looks like botanical lens. Sorry? So it looks like botanical lens. <laughs> yeah. So here we've got, I've made a little brush on the bottom of a boom, mm -hmm. or you can use a leaf blower if you don't want to use, I, I know a lot of people go through a greenhouse with leaf blowers to do their brushing, because it's or you could just take a PVC wand and do that. So chemical plant growth regulators, and we spend a lot of time, and I've probably spent a good bit of my career working on chemical plant growth regulators to give us a higher quality plant. And the chemical growth regulators that we use are primarily anti-gibberellins. Um, Gibberellins are a family of, of, of chemical, of natural plant growth substances that stimulate cell elongation, and the anti gibberellins actually disrupt it. And so what we're trying to do is to grow a more compact plant with our plant growth regulators. And uh, there's all different products out here. A-Rest or Encimidol is one, uh, one of those chemicals, inhibits gibberellin synthesis. Um, we apply it as a spray or a drench. Um, and Seminol is one of the more expensive ones. It's primarily used on crops like Easter lilies. And we put it on at a rate of about 33 to 36 parts per million. B9 is one of the more common plant growth regulators that, that's on the market. Diminazide, it reduces internode length as, again. The foliage is colored a deeper green. Um, because some of the gibberellins actually are precursors, the chemical precursors to gibberellic acid are shifted in their metabolic pathways and become chlorophyll. More chlorophyll, deeper green, so the plants actually look better. Uh, Dimenazide is also a compound that um, used to be used in the apple industry. Okay. Um, it was um, evaluated by a, a medical school where they fed laboratory rats a volume of dimenazide over time and eventually they developed cancer. The uh, media got a hold of it and the uh, actors and actresses, primarily people like Meryl Streep got a hold of it, talking about um, 
Apple's causing cancer. What is the biggest single industry for the Apple industry in the United States? What's the premium market for an Apple in the United States? What's that? Say that again. Fresh fruit? No. <laughs> Baby food. Baby food. So now you get the passions going up there. Well, they've done additional research on this to show that the volume of apples that you would have to consume to come close to the volume of diminazide they fed to the laboratory rats to cause cancer, you would have to eat two bushels a day for a month. Even I would be regular. So, regardless to say, uh, the company took it off the vegetable market and it's only in the floriculture market and it's just fine. But anyway, so what it, what it would do, what it would do is this product with some other plant growth regulators would take red delicious apple, which would form the, a nice elongated fruit and get those real pronounced lobes at the bottom and give us a nice bright, nice bright red color because that's what the American consumer wants is a big red delicious apple that tastes like crap. Well, better look good, that's about all it's good for. Hmm? The red delicious, it better look good because that's about all it's good for. It better look good. My opinion, what this has done is it's converted people to understanding that it doesn't have to be a brilliant red apple that tastes good. My favorite apple is a Fuji. And it looks like, it doesn't look good, does it? I personally processed 96 pounds of apples last weekend for my wife. <laughs> Five gallons of juice is now in cider bottles with a little bit of champagne yeast. That's my pay, payback. <laughs> Hard cider. Oh, Nick is wanting to come to my house. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah. Okay. It's applied as a soluble powder. It's effective when we get the upper two thirds of the leaves. Um, and typically, uh, we combine it with another product called Psychocell as a tank mix, and it's standard of the industry. Banzai Paclobutrazol is a product, both Banzai, Paclobutrazol, and Uniconazole, which is um, Sumagic, we'll get to it in a minute, are triazole compounds. And tri these are fallout chemistry from the fungicide industry. There, the, there are a lot of triazole fungi, uh, fungicides out there that um, never made it. They tr use them for other things because a lot of fun fungicidal activity is related to gibberellic acid metabolism in fungi. Um, some of the triazole compounds are best known as nail fungi for na uh, curing nail fungi. So nobody knows about that. So um, bonsai reduces internode elongation. It, we can apply it as a spray, a drench, a soak. Uh, it's most regularly uh, actively taken up by the stems or the roots. See, not on the leaves, whereas B9 is on the leaves. So you need to get it into the st into the stems. Typically applied as a drench, we can use bonsai as a drench after the red bracts have formed on poinsettias. If you don't get it on the foliage, that way it won't reduce the bract elongation and still have a short, compact plant. Um, we're applying this at about 10 to 50 parts per million, or 0.125 to 2.25 milligrams of active ingredient per pot. So it has to be very precise. Yes. Kelly. I'm not sure if you already went over it, but what's the importance of having a shorter, more compact plant? What's the importance of having a shorter, more compact plant? Very good question. A shorter, more compact plant ships better. It's not so top topsy turvy. In a dark, dark greenhouse where we're trying to keep the temperature down, we've got shade on, the shorter compact plant is gonna be f appear fuller, it's gonna have more intense color, it's gonna be better shaped. Um, it's going to ship better. It's going to last longer in the retail environment. And I will think I'll have some pictures here in a minute. 
Psychocell is one of the oldest products out there. It's actually a salt. Um, it's usually applied in combination with B9, um, chloramiquat, Sumagic. Sumagic and Bonsai are sister uh, chemicals. Um, Uniconazole was the first one to come out. This, this one, it's a lot more active. Both of these compounds have an affinity to pine bark. So if you have pine bark in the mix, you have to apply just a tad bit more because the, the pine bark actually locks it up for some reason. And but so this one is slightly more active than bonsai, but they're very similar, sim similar chemicals. When the Sumitomo company, um, which is um, when they created Sumagic, they ignored paclobutrazol, or which is now bonsai, and they didn't get a patent on it. So they lost the patent by not patenting both chemicals. Again, 0.1 milligram per pot. And the thing is, when pr people first started using these triazole um, plant growth regulators, you can put so much, so much on the, your plants, it'll never grow out of them. So you have to be very careful. Whereas bon with uh, D dimenazide or B9, that's 2,500. You're, you're scooping it out with a tablespoon. These you're measuring with a graduated cylinder. Other plant growth regulators that we use, uh, ethophon or Florel. This is a, a compound that releases ethylene. It's an acid, 2-chloroethylphosphonic acid. It's got a pH of about 4. When we spray it onto our foliage, it goes into the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is, is fairly alkaline, about 7 to 8. Converts, it, it takes the ethophon, destroys the molecule, and releases ethylene gas. And depending on the develop of development, where it is in the stage of growth, it'll take the flower buds off. So like in a chrysanthemum, where we're trying to grow the plant without flower buds to get it veg the vegetative growth and development up higher, we're using photoperiod. With a plant like a geranium, which is not photoperiod, we can spray it with ethophon, knock the flowers off, and we can get more cuttings. So if you're in the business of selling rooted cuttings to a client versus flowers, you can use that compound to increase your branching and the number of cuttings you can harvest. Increase the branching. And some growers actually use it for developing hanging baskets. Um, the new um, containers that w with multi-plants, lots of different kinds of plants and containers. So we can do a little application of, of ethophon at a certain develop, the plants will develop more fuller more and will actually bloom at the same time, even though they're different species, and give a, a prettier container pot, because a lot of our higher end greenhouses are making more money on those big, gaudy plants that uh, somebody can go in and buy for their party versus having to grow a garden full of plants. Negative effects include stunting, uh, flower delay, causes leaf abscission. For instance, right now, the cotton farmers, um, they went out and sprayed, um, in Mississippi, they went out and sprayed ethophon last weekend in ant anticipation of Isaac to get the leaves off the cotton so the cotton plants wouldn't blow away. So now they can go back in and harvest the bowls now. So, because they use ethophon to de-leaf the cotton fields. Um, applies a drencher spray. Um, this is one of those compounds that you need to experiment with. Another compound that came out, Fascination, this is a blending of cytokinin, specifically 6 benzyl aminopurine, or we call it BA, or in gibberellin. And it was originally a product developed for the apple industry, again, and it's currently still used in the apple industry to improve fruit shape and to, to give uniform ripening of apples. But we started using fascination illegally, and now it's legal to, um, as a um, plant growth regulator, we can use to, to maintain greenness of our foliage in the cooler. Um, delays aging. It's an anti-aging compound, um, so forth. Uh, when do you use plant growth regulators? Well, you use them when, um, 
for plant, you want to use it in plant height development. You want to use it as in, com in combination with graphical tracking. We'll look at graphical tracking when we do our plant modeling.